Good morning, everyone. This week's parsha is Parshat Bo. In the, in this week's parsha, we the parsha described the last three makos, the last three plagues that uh, Hashem gave on the midstream. Last week's parsha was Parshat Vaera, the seven first makot. <coughs> so this week's parsha started with Makata Arbe, then goes to the Choshech, the darkness, and then the Makat Bechorot, the killing of the firstborn of the Egyptians. Then there is a description in the Parsha about how to prepare in Egypt for the night of the redemption and all the description. The details about how to do the Korban Pesach, the shechting the lamb, then in Egypt and putting the blood on the door poles, and Yetziat Mitzrayim, Exodus actually happened. I mean, they went out of Egypt, described in this week's parasha at the end of it. Um, I want to, um, I think, this is a very, very important thing to learn from the parsha, uh, to emphasize the, re the, the, the philosophical results for us, for the history, not just for us, for the world, but especially for us as a nation, for the history. So let's go to the first few uh, verses in this week parasha. Uh, it's in uh, the beginning of the parasha, parashat bo. Okay? The first two psukim. Vayomer Hashem el Moshe. Bo el paro ki ani ikhbadeti et libo ve et lev avadav. So Hashem says to Moshe, instruct Moshe in Mitzrayim, came, go to paro. I made him on purpose stubborn. So we're talking about Let's remember seven makos that already happened. Seven plagues that already happened, and Paro was stubborn. So Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I, I made his heart hard in a way that he will not accept. Why? Leman shiti shiti ototai ele bekirbo. So that th that. Um, because I want to make all those miracles and all those proofs through him. I mean, Yitziat Mitzrayim, taking the Jews out of Mitzrayim, served bigger purpose. Not just take the uh, slaves out of their slavery, but there is something big over here that planned by God. Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, if you remember, even in Parashat Shemot already, when he sent him to Egypt, he told him, you're going to go talk to Paro that he will release him, and I'm telling you right now that he will not listen to you. <coughs> so it was planned in advance that he will not listen to you. And in this week, Parsha, we find out that the, the, what is the meaning of this? What, what, is, what, what would be gained from Paro being <coughs> refusing time after time and getting all these makos, all these uh, uh, plagues. So look at this pasuk. Leman shiti ototai ele bekirbo. Because I want to make all these signs in the world. And now he turned to us. Ulman tesaper beozne bincha uven bincha. Now he talked to the Jewish nation and he said, because I want you to tell your children and the children of your children to the history. I want you to tell, Hashem says to Moshe Ben, I want you, the, the nation, the Jewish nation, to tell this to your children and for the generations. And what will be the bottom line? And that you will know that I'm Hashem. No, what, what, is the, what is the idea? What is the bigger thing? <clears throat> the, 
many mitzvahs in the Torah that we do not just in Pesach are Zecher Li'itziat Mitzrayim, right? We do in Kiddush every Shabbos, right? <coughs> we sing in the Kiddush. Why are we doing this? Zecher Li'itziat Mitzrayim, in the memory of Yitziat Mitzrayim. <clears throat> Yitziat Mitzrayim mentioned in many places, Zecher Li'itziat Mitzrayim, in a memory. But it's not just a memory of something that happened then in the history. Here in this verse that we just read, it says, I want all the generations informed about what happened, and that will make them know that there is Hashem. V'idatem ki ani Hashem. By the way, it's really amazing to think about it, that during the history, we're talking about 3,300 years ago. The, the event happened 3,300 years ago. And since then, every Shabbat, every Shabbos, we do in Kiddush. And think about it this way. The elder person in the family, before we go into wash in order to have the food to, to eat Friday night, we take the cup of wine and we recite a few things. Many people have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, I mean they're you could even say it by heart, but pay attention to what we say. So this is an amazing testimony that going from generation to generation every week in all the Jewish families all over the world, all over the history, until today, until today, next Shabbos in a few days, we're going to do it again. The elder person in the family sang or informed his family, the children, the grandchildren. You know why we, this day is special? Among the other things, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. As it's written in the Ten Commandments, in Sefer Dvarim, Shamor et Yom HaShabbat Lekatsho, Vezacharta ki eved ha'ita be'eretz Mitzrayim. You should remember that you were a slave in Eretz Mitzrayim, and Hashem took you out. So that's what we're saying every week. We're passing the testimony from generation to generation. And here, before it happened, before you see at this time actually happened in this week, Parsha, in the verse we, that we just read, it says, that's why I'm doing this. Because I want you to inform your children and children of children, okay? And then you will know. Now let's talk a bit about knowing that you will know that I'm Hashem. The Ramban on this week parasha relate to this. And I will recite it. It's in the original, of course. In Hebrew, I try to translate it. But this Ramban is very, very important. It's in chapter 13, verse, verse 16. The Ramban says the following. And now I'm going to tell you a general rule. Of the reason of many mitzvot in the Torah. And he relate to a philosophical problem. From From the time that it was idol worshippers in the world, the way to look at things got twisted, got not right. Mehim, so you're talking about the population of the world from the old days. Mimei Enosh, Enosh was the grandson of Adam. So the third generation already. So he give a review of the twisted in the way to look at the reality. So he, he said that there are few kind of groups of heresies. Mehem kofrim ba'ikar ve'omrim ke ha'olam kadmon. One group deny the existence of God altogether 
and says that the world was here the way we know it always. Never was created, no creator. See, the Ramban relate to the, uh, saying this 900 years ago, and it's still popular among many, many people, atheists, that say, you know what? There is no God. We never saw him. We cannot be sure that he exists, right? So that was the thing that he wanted to address. How to relate to the, those who have doubts, okay? So some of them says, because we could not see God physically, technically, no real solid proofs, therefore we assume that it's nonsense. There is not such a thing. But some of them said, you know, if you look at the complexity and the sophistication of the creation, it doesn't make any sense that randomly all this amazing world, and then we're talking about the universe, exists. It doesn't make any sense. Therefore, okay, they agree, nice of them, that probably there is an intelligent power. We do not know how exactly this power look like or understand the essence of it, but there is probably uh, intelligent power of some kind that caused it to exist. But, but, they said that this existing power that created the world, the, the, the universe, and the laws of nature, do not really interested in what we as people doing. I mean, he's not uh, he, look, watch over us, see if we're good or not good. So this is another kind of heresy. That there is God, but he's not interested in us. Therefore, you could do whatever you want. I mean, try to be good the way you understand it, but don't think anyone really watching you. Says the Ramban that the entire, when we said that Many mitzvahs that we're doing are zecher litziat mitzrayim, for the memory of litziat mitzrayim. It's not just a memory. It's to address those things. Now, if you look at the story, the way it says in, in, in uh, Exodus, in Sefer Shmot, when Moshe Rabbeinu came first to Paro, and he told him, God, the God of the Hebrews, send me to you. Send my people. Let them go. The first response of Paro was, Mi Hashem asher who, who is God? Who is the God that you talk, you, you, you saying those things in his name? Lo yadati et Hashem, vegam et Yisrael lo shalech. Be aware of those words. Lo yadati, that's Paro, I'm quoting Paro. Lo yadati et Hashem, I do not know him. And it's not just I do not know him. I don't count him. For me, he's not exist. Uh, he's not there. Lo yadati et Hashem. That was the words of Paro. And Paro now represent the heresy of denying that there is such a thing, God. So actually, what Moshe Rabbeinu says to him during the entire negotiation, I'll say it in my words. You do not know. OK, if it's just a lack of knowledge, it could be fixable. I could teach you. You do not know, right? Learn. And he gave him 10 classes. Damn, <laughs> he gave him, He gave him the plagues, right? And he taught him what he didn't know, or he claimed that he didn't know, right? Now, I want to go and see through the Ramban and the other Mepharshim over here how the ten plagues making the not knowing Paro know. How, how really we understand, we, how he learned, how he taught him. It's not just, you know, a joke that he <laughs> taught him. He really taught him. But he didn't <coughs> taught him because Paro is not important. <coughs> he taught us. 
and he taught the world. And he taught us four generations. That was the entire idea. Paro was just the tool. He's not the purpose. The purpose is the world will know it. Now, says the Ramban, V'ka'asher yirtzei ha'elokim. The Ramban, I'm just explaining the Ramban, it's not my ideas. Ramban explained how through the plagues we know, not believe, know, 100%, no doubt, through the plagues themselves. So the logic uh, arguments over here are the following. V'ka'asher yirtzei ha'elokim be'eida o be'yachid. ויעשה עמהם מופת בשינוי מנהגו של עולם וטבעו, יתברר לכל ביטול הדעות האלה כולם. I'll translate it. When Hashem will want some group of people or one person, and he, Hashem, God, involved in the world, to change the laws of nature for them, it shows, and this is a logic argument, it shows that he is the creator of the universe. How? In order to really change, the, the laws of nature are steady, are very solid, very steady, always working, never got tired, ne never going to strike, right? They are very solid, the laws of nature. If the laws of nature will be changed on purpose, when God says in advance, I'm going to change them, not, temporary, not uh, permanently, temporary, for achieving certain things, that will show that he is the creator. How? Only the one who creates the laws of nature could control them and change them the way he wants. So this is the logic over here. So when Moshe came to Paro and he told him, God, the creator of the universe sent me to you, the messages send them out. And Paro says, no such a thing. I don't know him. I don't, I ignore, there is no, no God. So the way to teach him was to change the laws of nature, obviously, in a way that no one could argue, and shows that God is the master of the universe. Now let's see how, it's, how the process went. In the beginning, the first thing, if you remember last week, Parsha, before the blood, before the, the first Makkah, the first uh, plague, Hashem says to Moshe and Aaron, go to Paro, and if he will ask you for proof that you are talking in my name, do the following. Tell Aaron, Hashem says to Moshe, tell Aaron, your brother, that he will take his stick and throw it to the, the ground. And I'm telling you, Hashem says to Moshe, when, you'll, when Aaron will th throw the stick to the ground, it will become a crocodile or alligator. Crocodile. Crocodile. Um, okay, so that's what happened. They came to Paro, and Aaron did it. And the stick became a crocodile. Did Paro got impressed? No. If you remember? No. 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 He was so cynical. And he said, oh, that's your proof. That's your proof that you're talking in the name of God? I could prove you wrong. He went and he called his magicians. And he told Moshe and Aaron, they never talked to God. They could do the same trick. Throw your sticks. They threw their sticks, they become crocodiles. In magic. So he told them, you liar. You're doing a magical trick. Everyone could do this. And you claim that this is your proof that you're talking in the name of God? So what happened there that the crocodile of Aaron swallow theirs. Okay, but it's not a proof. Paro didn't work. He was not convinced. Then came the first marker, the blood. He told them in advance, if you're not going to send them, the entire water on the Nile River will become 
blood, not just colored red, blood, meaning you could contribute it to people who need blood. <coughs> and he, he didn't listen, so came the blood. If you remember, Paro again called his magicians. They did the same thing in magic. That the, the Torah described this. Meaning so far, it's going nowhere. Paro telling Moshe, that's not a proof. My guys are not the messenger of God, and they do the same thing. Besides, you have to know, by the way, for us, it's very hard to believe that there is such a thing called magic or black magic that really works. It seems not like a fairy tales. We have to know that there is such a thing. It's not that popular in this generation or now in the new time, but there is such a thing. Um, I don't have now enough time to explain how it works, but there are ways to, to, to do things like this, and it's real. It's real. It's not a fake thing. The water really became a blood, a real blood. But anyways, because there is a way to do it, in black magic, Paro says to Moshe, Mitzrayim, Egypt, is the center of black magic at the old time. So you come to play with me magic? It's like selling uh, ice to the Eskimos. Same thing. I mean, that's not it. OK, continue. Lesson number two, the frog. You'll not going to send them? Frogs will come and cover the entire land of Egypt and they will go to places that they are not usually there in your house, in your ovens. Frog came. Paro called the magician. The, to the Torah described last week, Pasha, they did the same thing. So it's still going nowhere until the third Makkah. And the third Makkah was a turning point. The lice. Aaron hit the ground, lice comes and cover the entire Egypt. Paro called the magicians, expecting that they will do the same. They tried and they failed. If you remember last week, Parsha, the magicians came to Paro and told him, after it says that they tried and they failed, they came to Paro and told him, listen, Take this guy seriously. This is not magic. We are the professional magician ever. There is nothing in magic that we could not do. If we could not do it and he did it, it's not magic. And then, if you remember, they said, Etzba Elokimi, this is a finger of God. This is a finger of God. Etzba Elokimi. The magician at this point, was sure that Moshe Rabbeinu is not a Moshe and Aaron are not magicians. They were in shock. And actually, again, that's a, ho a whole topic by itself, but it's a shame that we do not have time today to look at it. I just will tell you. Those uh, magicians were really smart people. That's why Paro relate on them. When they told Paro, this is not magic, Paro still was stubborn and didn't listen. But they was in shock, in a way, that they start admire Moshe. And every Makkah that came after that, they admired Moshe more and more and more, as it says in Lewis Dixit Parsha, גם האיש משה גדול מאוד בעיני עבדי פרעה ובעיני העם. He become greater and greater at the eyes of עבדי פרעה. עבדי פרעה are the magicians. And בעיני העם, the Jewish nation, and the Egyptians, but not פרעה. פרעה continue to be stubborn. The turning point by the magicians let them become the fans and the admirers of Moshe. At the end of this parasha, 
something terrible happened because of this admiration, admiring Moshe by them. After the 10th Makkah, when Paro finally convinced to let them go, the Jews, they went out of Egypt. And it says in this week Parsha, the Pasuk says, Vegam Erev Rav Alaitam. And also, Erev Rav, meaning other non Jewish people, came with the Jews out of Egypt. Those Erev Rav was a big, big problem for the Jewish nation for generations, until today, until the end of days. Who were they? Says the Medrash, and says the Zohar, the Zohar, the, Zohar Kodesh, the Kabbalah book, say it clearly that the heads of the Erev Rav, which was many non-Jews who follow Moshe and came out of Egypt, the heads of them were the magicians of Paro. They told Moshe, listen, you are our teacher. You are our guru. We cannot let you go and stay here. We're coming with you. And they came. The magicians, those magicians that in the beginning Paro tried through them to prove that there is no God, they came with Moshe. Not because they start to believe in God. They were astonished and amazed by the power of Moshe. They still not themselves are not believing in God, but they believe in Moshe because Moshe proved that he has something that they do not have. And you know, when a real, real professional meets someone in his field that he knows that he is way more than him, if he's honest, it will be his follower. That would happen. Now, okay, th and that's the story about the Erev Rav, and they, they caused a lot of problems. They were the one who made the golden calf. They were the one who, and they are, they are not Jewish. They joined the Jewish people, but they, they caused a lot of problems during the history. Let's go back to Mitzrayim before all of, all of this happened. Okay. Says the Ramban. Let's go to the Ramban. The Ramban says the following. When Moshe Rabbeinu actually told Paro, you do not know, right? You, do not, you say you do not know God? I'll teach you. How? I'll teach you by doing things that I'm telling you in advance it's going to happen. And there is no record in the history that it happened before that the water turned to blood. And I'm telling you, you're not going to send them. It's going to happen today, now. And was a blood. So power in the beginning, he thought, it's magic. Fine, the fraud, magic. Then came the lies. The lies shows already at least for the honest people, which is the magicians and the nation, that it's not magic. If it's not magic, the only other way is by controlling. And who could control? Only the one who created the laws of nature. That was the entire thing. Now, says Ramban, when God changing the laws of nature because of someone, it disprove the doubt or make sure that there is a creator. Now, what are the proofs? The popular heresy that was so popular in the world until a few decades ago <coughs> was that the world or the universe is here, was here always. Never was beginning point. That was the philosophy of the Greek philosophers that they were popular in science until a few decades ago, until the theory of the Big Bang. Before the theory of the Big Bang, Scientists or people who thought they are rational and logic assume that the world or the universe 
was always here, no beginning point, and for, therefore no creator. Then, by the, the new uh, understanding discoveries in science, there is now, a few decades already, the theory of the Big Bang. You have to understand that the theory of the Big Bang is not really significantly different than the kfira that than the heresy that was before. Why? Because no one, even according to what the theory said, said that it was a big bang and then everything happened. When it happened? A few billion years ago. Whatever. But even according to this theory, <coughs> was something before the Big Bang that got exploded. Right? So few questions still there. What, what was before, and when it started, and who put the bomb? How it's exploded. So what they say, randomly. So it's randomly exploded, and randomly the entire thing, the, all the nature, all the universe, all the laws of nature are random. Many people who consider smart today think so. This is the dumbest thing. I mean, if you <laughs> look at, the, at, at anything, in any element in the nature, if you will think, I'll give you only one, one example to prove it. It's, you have to be so dumb, and it's amazing how many <laughs> dumb people there are in the world. It's amazing. If someone will tell you that it was a tornado, let's say in Alabama, sometimes it happened. And there is a big American uh, Air Force base there. And it was over there, a whole airplane, warplane, or a jumbo, whatever. All the parts not connected. All the parts that you need for the entire airplane, but it's not connected to each other, they're apart. And it was a tornado, and the tornado I don't know, make them, <laughs> and they fall, but they fall in a way that every piece falls in its place, and we, we have now an airplane that could fly, take off. <laughs> that would be so stupid to even think that it's a possibility. It's, there is no way statistically that things like this happen. Now, the dumbest, amazing, popular heresy here, in, in this Im imaginary example that I gave you, the parts are there. They're just not connected. This crazy theory said that the part is not there. The part was created randomly, and they connected randomly, and they make a function in airplane. I don't know how to describe that. But be aware of the following. Take a mosquito. Look at it. Isn't it an airplane? Mosquito. It could fly, land, even fuel itself. And it's small. It's a small airplane. Take all the technology and all the knowledge that we have today in the world. <coughs> Let any group of scientists create a mosquito, not from metal, from a mosquito. We do not know how to do it. We know how to make space shuttle, but not a mosquito. It's much more complicated. That will, you know, any, <laughs> even from metal, something that go by itself, up, down, maneuver, fuel itself, no such a thing. And who knows when the technology will even think about maybe do something. One mosquito. What about the entire, everything? You have to be completely crazy. And let me inform you, most of the people of the world are crazy. <laughs> when I was young, I thought that the vast majority of the, the, the world are smart. There are a few dumbs. Just the opposite. <laughs> it's just the opposite. Prove, I, we just proved it. I mean, think about it. 
It's very interesting, so how? Why? Why people are so, it's not that, <laughs> Um, I don't know, hard to, to, to just think about it. You think about the three minutes, you understand that the entire theory is crazy. <coughs> and yet it's the most popular theory. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because it's convenience. Why convenient? It's convenient. Uh, it's very nice for a person to think that he is the master of the universe. There is no other master, because there, if there is another master, it's obligated me to do something that um, I'm not interested. That's enough. It says in the Torah, Hashochad ye'aver einei chachamim. When you bribe someone, judge, he will become blind. And the Torah says, Hashochad ye'aver einei chachamim. The smartest person, when they got bribed, they could not judge right. There is no more bribe than my desires and my ego. This is the strongest bribe ever, and that's it. Now, leave the heresies. Let's concentrate on us. OK. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu says to Paro, I'm talking in the name. I'm sending to you. I'm a messenger of the master of the universe. If you will not send them, I'll show you. First of all, you're going to get hurt. You, the country. But I'll show you through this that God, I'm talking in the name of God. So the fear of the heresy at the time was that the world will exist always. The Torah claim in the beginning, Pasuk, the first verse in the Torah is this uh, philosophical argument. Bereshit bara elokim et hashamayim et haaretz. There is a creator who created everything. So they deny that. And the plagues shows if the world <coughs> exists always, no creator, no one could change the laws of nature. If someone will change the laws of nature, if this is a proof that he is the master of the universe. The first commandment is, Anochi Hashem Elokecha asher otzetiha me'eretz mitzrayim mi'bet avadim. I am God who took you out of Egypt. This is the first commandment. It's connected, the two things. I'm God, Hashem says, who took you out of Egypt. Why not I'm God who created the world? Taking out, out of Egypt, it's very nice, it's very impressive. I mean, to change the laws of nature, to take a whole nation of slaves against the uh, will of their, their owners, their masters, their... It's very impressive, but there is something even more impressive. I'm God who created the world. Says Rambam, Maimonides, in his halacha book, in the first halacha, Hilchot Yesodei Torah, the foundation of the Torah, <laughs> that every Jew should know that there is God. Not believe, know. No, this is a halakha, this is, that's the way we should do. This is a, the first halakha in the Rambam, that we should know. Continue the Rambam and says, and how could we know? No, no, how could we know? <laughs> Says the Rambam, and knowing this thing, that there is God who created the world, mitzvah aseh. It's a mitzvah in the Torah. Where is this mitzvah written? In the first commandment. Anochi Hashem elokecha asher otzatich ha-meretz mitzrayim. Here it's written that you have to know that there is God. How? Says Rabbeinu Bechaye, the disciple of the Ramban. Velo amar, anochi Hashem elokecha asher barati et haolam. In the first commandment, it doesn't say, I'm your God who created the universe. Why? Because the commandment over here is for us to know, not to believe, to know. If it will say, I'm God who created the universe, you could not, because of this, 
command us to know because who were there when God created the world to know to see that God is the creator of the world because the commandment is for us to know therefore he commanded us says the Ramban because you were there remember we're talking about 50 days after the 10th plague they went out to the desert they went to the uh, Mount Sinai 50 days after they went out of Egypt they got the Torah they got the Ten Commandments right so God talked to who to who to the people that in, in their eyes experienced everything that happened in Egypt the ten plagues by the way took 12 months from the dam to the, the Makata dam from the blood to the killing of the firstborn it was 12 months in all this time the Jews were there in Egypt and because the plagues were not just to release them if it was only to release them Hashem didn't it's it's not a necessity to have 10 plagues he will give them the last one and he forced the Egyptians to take them out why did all the tens not for Paro and that was the, the beginning of this week Pasha Leman revot moftai I will make many of them so no one could say it's happened it was just random it's it's not on purpose the Jews were there and even Paro himself the stubborn Paro learned in the hard way not to say that the Jews so because they were there and they were witnessing everything they saw all the plagues and let me just give you an example from the last one once I gave uh, a, a class about this and I, I never know who comes to my to my uh, who, who will be the audience so it happened that was a nurse in in the audience and after the the class she, she told me you know what I could when I got to the Makata Dever Dever is, is a, is a um, how do you say this uh, the killing of the animal it's a virus that killings animals right in my field there is no such a thing if there is a, f a virus the virus go from animal to animal right Moshe Rabbeinu says to Paro in advance you will not send them will come a, how do you say Makar a plague that will kill all the animals all the animals of the Egyptian and he told him in advance all the animals of the Egyptians will be killed no one even one from the Jews will not be hurt and he refused and the play came and it says that Pharaoh went out to check and he found out that no one of the animals of the Jews got hurt now she told me how could it be if it's a virus imagine a donkey of a Jew slave Jew stand next to a horse of the um, uh, Egyptian uh, whatever officer if it's a virus it, right. it will kill everyone so to control viruses and tell them kill this but not kill this that's an amazing thing and Paro verified it and he find out that that what happened now leave Paro aside the Jews were there they saw it in their eyes and this is about this market but everything else also Let, take the darkness the darkness the the, ten, the ninth Makkah right the darkness how could it be that for the Egyptians it will be darkness and the same time in the same place for the Jews will, will be light that's crazy that that's something that if really happened it shows clearly the control of God so that was the idea the entire idea is to prove all of those things and therefore when Hashem gave us the Torah he told us I took you out of Egypt and take you out of Egypt was involved all those things that you saw in your eyes therefore you know that there is God only the Creator of the laws of nature could control them Th this message 
pass to your gener children and your children's children and your children's children. Therefore, the bottom line is you will know, you do not believe, you know until today. We today, if you really learn this the way we try to learn it now, you could summarize to yourself, we know, we do not be believe. You know, Jews are not the believers. Jews are very criticize everything. You know, they're not accepting things. <laughs> they're not accepting just because someone said. So think about it. How do I know? How do you know? I'll tell you how. You heard it from your parents. You heard it every kiddush, every, fr every Friday night. But not just this. Many, many, many things. Many mitzvot that we're doing. The action that we do. Our Jewish lifestyle. And I'm, not, I'm talking about the real lifestyle. Real. We, we, we're given or doing testimonies in many things that we do as Jews. The mitzvahs. Part of it is to... Pass it from generation to generation. Therefore, we know. And you know what? Let me ask you. I mean, let me, I, I want to make it so clear in a way that no one could say, yeah, maybe. No, no maybes. You'll see. Um, I used to work, and I'm still working, in Kirov. Kirov, Kirov, uh, meaning uh, getting Jews who got lost or le lost their Jewish identity back to uh, have Jewish uh, identity. Um, so for many, many years, I worked for Arachim. Arachim is the, one of the biggest uh, Kirov organization in the world that were located in, in, in Eretz Israel. And I was, it's a big uh, organization. We have different um, departments or divisions. I was part of the staff that deal with the uh, hard cookies. <laughs> hard cookies, meaning hard, tough cookies, yes. Meaning Israelis, <laughs> meaning Israelis were in the left, left, anti, 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 more than any anti that we even could imagine. And um, we have to convince them that the Judaism is true. So it's not easy job. <laughs> so the thing is that when you, so I try to give all the arguments. And because they are tough cookies, <laughs> one of them told me, you know what? I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I, I hear your theory. But maybe it's all. Not, it's all fake. I told him, he got on my nerves. So I, I said, OK, <laughs> listen. You, have, you cannot just throw to the air such an argument. I want you, let me go, let me accept your assumptions. I'll show you how it doesn't make any sense. Now you tell me. I, I have, after you ask me all the question, I have a question for you, for your theory. OK? Let's assume that it's all nonsense. Never was Yitziat Mitzrayim, never was Kriyat Yamsuf, the split of the sea. The, the, never was, you know, more than all of this. You know what the Torah described? That the Jewish people, right after they went, left Egypt, they exist in the desert for 40 years with every day coming food from heaven. This is completely cuckoo. I mean, even to think about it as a rational person, to feed millions of people, not one day, not two days, 40 years. And the Jews believe in this. They seem so off. I mean, could you really imagine? So that was a theory. It's all baloney. It's all nonsense. Uh, OK, let's assume that you're right. Now you have to answer my questions. There are Jewish people here in the world today. Some of them, not the vast majority, but some of them still keeping Shabbat, Pesach, Sukkot, some of them. 
And you know, even though today it's only a small percentage out of the, I was saying this, out of the 14 million Jews that we have today in the world, maybe two millions are keeping Shabbat and eating kosher and performing Judaism with no games, the way it is. But this is today. If you go back 200 years ago, 300 years ago, before the Enlightenment, which I called darkness, all Jews were keeping everything, right? This is the fact. Now, according to your theory, it's all nonsense. Now my question to you is, how someone, you have to tell me, in the period time of the 3300 years, I want you to pinpoint the time that someone came with these fake ideas about all the history, he made up history, right? That the Jews went out of Egypt, they were all me. Two questions. First of all, when it happened during the history, and who is the genius who succeeded to do this? To convince Jews that something that never happened happened. And from now on, you have to put on tefillin every day to keep Shabbos. Could you tell me how it's possible? First of all, when it happened in the history? Who is the one who did it? Why no one would know who he is, this faker, and what he gained from this? Do you think there is any answer to those questions? None. None. I prove it to you now. Imagine that someone today will come and make up history that never happened. I'll give you, just to make it easy for you. You know anti-Semitism, there is such a thing, right? So let me tell you a story. 400 years ago, in Brazil, was a very severe phenomena of, uh, phenomena of uh, uh, anti-Semitism. It was just a real strong anti-Semitism that hurt the Jewish community in Brazil 400 years ago. The leaders of the community said, we cannot fight it. We have to run away because it's dangerous. They're going to kill us. So it was about 40,000 Jews over there in Brazil. And the leaders deliver a message. A certain day, all of you go to the beach of uh, Rio de Janeiro. They went in the middle of the night, 40,000 Jews, and the leader who gathered them to save them from the anti-Semitism <coughs> lift his hand, the ocean split, and they start walking. They cross the ocean. Took them four months. They arrive to Spain. And from Spain, they continue to the land of Israel 400 years ago. When they arrived to the land of Israel, it was Tuesday afternoon, 2 o'clock. The Jews in the land of Israel at the time were very happy about those 40,000 Jews who came from Brazil. And they tried to get them. They have nothing to offer them. <coughs> but they offer them the thing that was at the time, it was a boreca <laughs> and a can of Coke. <laughs> to every immigrant, it was Tuesday, 2 p.m. And since then, to memor memorize this amazing event, every Tuesday, every Tuesday, 2 p.m., every Jew doing a kiddush over a boreca and a can of Coke. Uh, it really happened. You do not believe me? Why? <laughs> why don't you believe me? Maybe it happened. You know why you do not believe me? Because it's never happened. But if I tell you not less crazy story, not 400 years ago, but 3,300 years ago, the Jews went out of Egypt and they ate matzah because 
because they ate matzah. <laughs> and until today, every year, in the same night that they went out of Egypt, they ate matzah to memorize it. It's true. And it's not less crazy than what I said before. The only difference is this is true and this is fake. So if someone will make it out, how he convinced Jews to do such a stupid thing for history that never happened? So there are no answers for the heresies to those questions. We are a living witnesses. Living witness, not just because of the fact that we eat matzah in Pesach. It's not just once a year. Every mitzvah that we do is zechel itziat mitzrayim. You cannot make it. You cannot fake it if it's not true. That's what Hashem says in this week's parasha. By the way, how much time we have? I could talk and talk. We have a break now? We need a break. Okay, so let's summarize this thing, uh, then continue. Uh, <clears throat> When Hashem says in the beginning to Moshe, Boel Paro, ki ani ikhbadati libo, I'll make him her heart, because I want to make all those things, leman tasaper bozne bincha uven bincha. Because I want it forever, a history, testimony on the fact that God is the creator of the world. Okay, so take a break, and there is another thing that I want to add to this, but... This is now. Okay, the break. <laughs>